estimated that is 12.2 billion US dollars worth of food wasted. Okay. Let me put the issue like this to you, Ashish Abroad. In 2006, the University of Western Ontario in Canada did a study, and it's an unquestioned study at the moment, which showed that 20% of India controls 70% of the country's wealth. In any democracy, the government has a duty to try and even out that figure. And surely one of the essential first steps is to curb wasteful expenditure at large functions and weddings, which only exacerbate social divisions and add to the disharmony of the country. Well, you know, the point that you make, the study is obviously very revealing and the numbers are very, very shocking. Uh, like I said earlier, the argument is absolutely valid and there needs to be something that needs to be done. However, I think the remedy that is being recommended is what I don't agree with. Even this point that you just made about the study from the University of Western Ontario, I think the issue here is that we are a poor country and there's division between the haves and the have-nots. However, is the solution curbing and opposing free market operation? Uh, I, I don't think so. My remedy would be that we need to create a policy environment. I think the solution to all such issues is creating the right policy environment. That's why governments are in the business. Can I, can I put this to you? If Pakistan, and I admit freely that they have economic problems which we don't share, but as a society in terms of values that is identical to us. So if Pakistan can impose an order which limits the amount of food served at weddings, why is it something that we shouldn't even consider? I don't think we should even consider it because I think if, if, if I were to agree with your point then uh, you know, we are a very different economy from, from, the, uh, from, from Pakistan. We are a much larger economy. We are a much freer economy. We are a far more uh, open and liberal economy. So I don't think we should be comparing India and Pakistan. Pakistan is a much smaller economy and I think this is a knee-jerk reaction by a much smaller neighbor uh, which, is not, which, is going, uh, uh, you know, which is not going in the right uh, way in any, any okay. case. We are talking, Harsh Mandir, about a trade-off between materialism on the one hand and I suppose what you can loosely call values on the other. Now, the the problem is this, that India wants to grow at 9, maybe 10 percent, that's the admitted goal of the government, it's one that the country shares, but if you want to grow at that rate, you have to permit people to create wealth, and people who create wealth will want to spend it, some will want to show off. Now the showing off may be undesirable, but it's part of human nature. If you now try and put curbs on human nature, you could end up retarding development altogether. Might this not have a terrible impact? on India's dreams and hopes of growth, which are the only real way of abolishing poverty? No, I think that growth by itself has, ha, it, you know, we've seen evidence of the fact that we've had extraordinary levels of growth and yet millions of people have got left behind, uh, 200 million people sleep hungry every night uh, in this country. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Ashish was asking about whether, you know, would this interfere with the free market? Of course we need to interfere with the free market. Redistributive uh, interventions are, are, are required. I mean, should we, should we impose uh, uh, restrictions on larger cars? Of course we should impose restrictions on larger cars. Uh, we should uh, have. I mean, I think that's the business of government, uh, even while you, even if we go in for a, for a, for a market-led growth, to ensure redistributive policy so that everybody develops alongside. And the last thing about growth, I don't, you know, I think there's a great deal of, you know, people believe there's a contradiction between aspirations for equity and growth. growth. I don't agree. You know, if every second child is malnourished, for instance, it is about 46 percent. Uh, uh, what kind, that means that their brains and their bodies are not f forming and, uh, you know, uh, that when they grow up to be workers, they're not going to have the same intellectual and physical abilities that they should. So what kind of growth is that? I think more money in the hands of a few or a little more money uh, in the hands of all people uh, would also go into the economy. So you can have a, you can have a wage-led growth and you can have a sort of profit-led growth and they're two, uh, two alternative paths, but they're not contradictory to growth. Okay. Let me put it like this, Mr. Arun Kumar. Will a limit on guests or on the number of functions or on the quantity of food end up affecting the livelihood of people or of shops that cater for such large celebrations? In the end, might it also affect farmer incomes? I don't think so because if you go into the statistics, what is the production of food and what is the population we have and how much of them are ha not having a square meal, if you calculate that... Can, 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 no can, I, can I interrupt? 30 to 40 percent, 30 percent at the lower end, probably 40 is a more accurate figure of Indian farm produce rots 
before it even gets to the market. Now if on top of that you put restrictions on what can be served, then what a farmer sells will shrink even more. You are going to affect farmer incomes no, very substantially and that's 66% of your population. That's totally a different matter. For that what we have to do, we have to do. It's true that a uh, lot of food that is produced is being wasted. For that, it's a now you're matter. stopping no. people from even selling and buying, so there'll no, be no, more food that will be wasted. Vulgar display of wealth, okay. You can call 5,000 guests, give them each guest one car as a presentation because they have attended the wedding. But to confine this particular dining dining thing, that is where the food is being wasted. It's that is to be confined. That no, there is nothing wrong in Ashish it. Ashish abroad, it seems to me that the real touchstone of the argument is not the economics. Not even, although it is a very important concern, the relative malnutrition and deprivation, the real touchstone is the vulgarity, the ostentation, which in a poor country is deeply disturbing and becomes in fact a moral issue. As someone who runs an organization called the Big Fat Indian Wedding, and presumably therefore you revel in a sense in this size, how do you ensure that quality of celebration is maintained rather than <laughs> vulgarity? Uh, you know, Karan, I think <coughs> I go back to saying the same thing, uh, that vulgarity and ostentation and display of wealth uh, is, is a personal matter and I don't think governments have a role there at all. Uh, the, moment go the moment governments start to interfere and dictate what is the way an individual or an organization needs to display its wealth or what it owns, I think that's where the problem starts and that's interference in the operation of a free economy. And I think Mr. Harshmandir mentioned that Op interfering in the operation of a free economy is okay. I completely disagree. I think it's not okay. I think the reason that India is today where it is, one of the biggest reasons is that we take one step forward and three steps backward. And this is exactly one of those points. And you, I go back to the same thing that you mentioned about Pakistan earlier. I think we need to be comparing ourselves in this respect, if at all, with the capitalist nations. Pakistan okay. is not a free capitalist society. We should be comparing ourselves with the United States. We should be comparing ourselves with Europe. Have any of them ever done, uh, implemented a restriction like this on free operation of the economy? Well, the United States actually had prohibition right through the 20s and it did it for moral reasons. They may have then changed their constitution to do away with it, but the answer alcohol. to your question is but that, that was alcohol. And it was done for moral reasons because it was considered to be something that was undesirable. So it comes from the Bible, the entirely different issue. comes from the Bible, that's a religious dictate which tells them that you should not be consuming alcohol. This is an entirely different, this is right. an ostentation. Let's take a break at that point. Let's come back and ask if we were to consider implementing such restrictions. How would we go about it? Would that in fact suggest that they are so difficult to implement, so impractical, that they ought not to be considered at all? In other words, not in terms of concept, but in terms of practice, does this become a very difficult issue? See you in a moment's time.